Good morning, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. Dude, you're, you're speaking my street when you when you release a book like this, Over My Dead Body. I, I am not afraid of death. I really do believe that we can communicate with those on the other side because they want to be heard. Excellent. Excellent. You're speaking my language as well. Oh, my God, dude. I mean, to, to write this book, though, are you looking over your shoulder or do you feel like that you are in the center of, of a, a bunch of uh, spirits and spirit guides that want to share their ver- their version? You know, I really, I... I I'm trying to tell the story of the cemeteries themselves. Yep. So I, I'm telling the story of the people who are in them, but then also these amazing places. Yeah, because it, I mean, in reality, isn't it like walking through a museum? I mean, I love the way headstones are designed. Exactly. And and really, cemeteries were the first American museums, the first public art museums that people could go to. And, and you think about there are 144,000 cemeteries across the country. A lot of us just pass by them every day. But... When you walk inside and you see the artwork and you see the stories that they tell, these places really do come alive. And, and whether it's through some kind of spiritual means or just culturally or however you want to define it, it really is uh, when you stop and take a look at the surroundings there, it, it really is a, a unique experience. We got to go back to the beginning. Listeners need to understand that you used to work at a cemetery. You were the one that kept it looking beautiful. Uh, what what about those rules that you're not supposed to step on the grave? And Greg, my God, you were mowing the lawn. Yeah, well, it depends on the cemetery. And I, I think you're giving me a lot of credit if you say that I was keeping it beautiful. Uh, but <laughs> I did my part. Uh, and I also dug graves occasionally. Oh but it really God. depends. It, it, which was an experience as well, but it, it really uh, it depends on the cemetery. In some places, like one time I went for a bird tour in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is this historic place, which was the birthplace of landscape architecture, basically, and was the first city park in a lot of respects. In wow. fact, it literally calls itself the first city park. Uh, and so when I went on this bird tour, uh, we walked all over the graves, uh, which really kind of shocked me at first. But yeah, I mean, I mowed I mowed graves in, in my local hometown cemetery. And this was kind of in the early days of my new cemetery experience. And I realized that it, it largely depends on the style and personality of the place on there are other places where you can't do that. So in Philly, do I understand this right, that there is a nature a nature sanctuary there in Philly? Yeah. So one of their historic cemeteries has created this natural burial ground. Really? It's the most <clears throat> natural burial ground probably in the country. And basically it, it takes you back in time for burials, a couple hundred years at least in the United States, where the graves are dug by hand and there's no grass. It's just... Uh, wildflowers that someday will turn into trees and a forest over this spot. And the graves themselves, you can't be embalmed. You can't be in an ornate uh, casket. It has to be either a pine box or a shroud. And there's no grave marker. You just kind of go back into the earth. Man, see that—that's the kind of history that. See, I, I'm not—I'm not, I'm not going to be buried. I'm going to be cremated. But the thing is, though, mm-hmm. is that you—you you can still have the headstone. You can still do different things in in a cemetery, and and I like the idea that it's 100% all natural in this. Yes, and that really is a trend. A lot of people are looking at the environmental footprint of burials yeah. and trying to find different ways. And it's also, frankly, a lot less expensive. Yeah. When you write a book like this, did you did you take your writing instruments into the cemeter- cemeteries themselves and and feel the spirit of of those headstones as well as going into the buildings and things? Because I've always there's there's always a house on at a cemetery yeah. or, or a building. I've always wanted to go in there to see what are you guys doing. <laughs> yeah, I I do. Uh, it's an interesting question about the writing process. I absolutely do take notes because. In the moment when you have these feelings, they're so fleeting. It's hard to remember them even 20 Mm -hmm. or 30 minutes later. The only way that I could really capture what it feels like to be in that place at that moment is to make sure that I had a pen and a piece of paper in hand so I could really make sure that I was true to the experience as much as possible. Are cemeteries changing in the way that, because one of the things, I mean, I, I'm not seeing so many tents alongside the road these days. Is it because uh, may, maybe during the lockdown, people said, you know what, I'm going to keep the ashes for myself? There is some of that for sure. Um, right now, cremation is more popular in the United States than 
uh, burials are. And that's mm-hmm. been trending that way for decades and has really kind of taken off. Uh, people are looking at different ways to memorialize uh, because of, like I said, the economics and also because social media gives us another medium for being able to memorialize ourselves and find immortality. You know, as we get closer to Halloween, of course, when you get into the South and things like this, they they have the basically the spook tours at night. Are we interrupting the flow of a cemetery such as Laurel Gro- Grave or Grove in, in, in Savannah in, in the way that, you know, look, th- th- come see it in the daytime when you can see everything. Don't let your imagination fool you at night. So I'm kind of with you on that. Uh, I, I have to admit that, but but I think that really anything that helps bring the community into a cemetery and mm-hmm. helps them embrace the history and the art, I think ultimately is a good thing. If you go out to Hollywood Forever Cemetery out in Los Angeles, they have movie nights and concerts within the cemetery <laughs> uh, in order to get people to go in. So there is this this kind of balance, right? And so is it disrespectful? I don't know. That's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it does make me cringe a little bit uh, because you're using the cemetery as a prop. But I think that when you go into these cemeteries, uh, if you've never been in one of them before, like the historic cemeteries of Savannah, which are just so yes. incredible, then it it can't help but open your eyes and give you a new appreciation. Why the walls? Because, I mean, that, that's the one thing that always bothered me. You know, people always told the jokes, you know, so they can keep the, you know, everybody inside. But I, 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 the walls add such a mystique to it. Yeah, well, it really depends. Uh, in the 19th century, grave robbing was really a problem. Really? And uh, y- you need to protect these places just like anywhere else. Wow, I never even thought about that. I mean, because, you know, I mean, in Charleston, I mean, you, you knew where the grave was because, uh, you know, how tall the wall was. Right. And it was really a problem during that time, not only for people who were trying to steal trinkets or whatever, but also from medical schools. Uh, There weren't a lot of ways that medical students were able to get bodies. So they would form these clubs and they would go in two-person teams to cemeteries to dig up bodies to use as cadavers in the new medical schools that were springing up across the country in the mid to late 19th century. And a lot of the laws that were put into place were actually because of medical students. Wow. Don't you think a book like Over My Dead Body is going to create a a, a bucket wish list in the way of, hey, I want to travel from city to city and go visit these graves because it'll say a lot about the community. Yeah. uh, Kind of 15 cemeteries to see before you die kind of thing. I I understand that. But also I, I hope that it gives people a new appreciation about America. Right. Mm -hmm. This book is also trying to show people a story about America as seen through these unfiltered lenses of cemeteries. And in some ways, perhaps it will make people more thoughtful about burial grounds in their own hometown, whether or not they're mentioned in, in the book. But what do you personally learn from this? Because, I mean, because in, in reality, you're an archaeologist and right now you're a teacher. Yeah. What do I learn? Well, you know, when I was researching the book, I didn't realize how influential cemeteries were on American history, how they shaped how we design suburban subdivisions, how they were the first city parks and also the first art museums that people could go to. Uh, they were a cemetery out in Los Angeles was really kind of the first theme park in America. And for 40 years, it was the largest tourist attraction in California until Disneyland was created. And Disneyland used the layout of this cemetery, uh, or Walt Disney did, to create the layout of of Disneyland. And just these amazing stories about how interwoven cemeteries are in our history, uh, just as I was doing the research, just really shocked and surprised me in so many amazing ways. Let's talk about Monticello's African-American graveyard. What, What is the history on this? So it is a small very simple plot that is the first thing you see when you go to Monticello. And for until this century had been forgotten, which is interesting because Thomas Jefferson was a very meticulous record keeper who kept notes on everything, but he did not keep track. um, You can, you can assume uh, basically intentionally uh, of where the bodies were buried for the enslaved people who lived on his estate 
And when you go there, it's just a very profound place. <clears throat> it, it contrasts the very deliberate and well-planned out plot that Thomas Jefferson created for himself and his memorial, which is a big obelisk, and the, uh, the epitaph that he wrote for himself because he understood that cemeteries were something, his burial ground would be something that people would visit for centuries to come. And it's very interesting that he didn't leave any record of where the enslaved people were buried on his ground. Wow, you just gave and, me you just gave me a vision of of uh, the Billy Graham Library here in Charlotte, where Billy Graham and mm -hmm. his wife were buried, and and yeah. I and, and and I I was shocked to learn that the very place that they're buried is the very place that I wrote before they before they even passed, and 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 it's yeah. like and it's like oh my god, I mean I I came here to write all the time. Are, will will there be future episodes or, or 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 books and stuff like that about these little private places? such as the Billy Graham Library? I, I certainly hope so. Um, There's so many amazing uh, burial grounds at, in North Carolina. I used to live for a long time in Asheville yeah. and Riverside Cemetery there. It's just so amazing. You have Thomas Wolfe and, and, who's buried there and it's this, this, in this Victorian part of town. And, um, you know, North Carolina is this treasure trove of amazing small family cemeteries. And yeah. then also these incredibly artistic cemeteries and also these important burial places uh like you mentioned do you, when you get out when you go to you know let's say jamestown a, a cemetery from 1607 yeah. do, do you take paper mm -hmm. with you and, and you know and do the the pencil ske sketches or or to, you know, the rubbings and all that kind of stuff i don't traveling with my family and uh I, it usually takes a lot of bribery for me to get them into burial grounds yep. so uh i'm uh i i'm careful about what I do to not creep them out too much. But uh, I, I love the, the tracings uh, and when people do that and how they are taking a piece of these uh, really important uh, artifacts home with them. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it, it, what's so fa funny and, and, and so in, you know, filled with love and care are when you go to these cemeteries that are ancient and and the way that they did the the artwork on on the headstone and stuff like that i mean they they would have sculptures and and, and it was it was like god what what was it like to create this for this family right right it it really tells a lot about a lot of these whether they're these grand tiffany glass window mausoleums or uh whether they're just uh small uh, gravestones with beautiful epitaphs on them. They do tell a lot about the love of a family uh, and, and how they've dedicated and and memorialized their love to their loved ones who are in some of these places. This this book needs to get in the hands of the Girl Scouts, and the reason why is because there 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 are many of the Girl Scouts that go out looking for these for these hidden away cemeteries. For instance, there's one over on 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 Sharon Road West where this Girl Scout goes into this area. She takes note of a headstone on the ground. All of a sudden, it's several different headstones, and that became her project to make sure yeah. that this cemetery is preserved forever. Right, and. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned that, and there are a lot of Eagle Scout projects like that as yeah, well, yeah. where where some forgotten or forlorn or unfunded cemetery is brought back to life literally and figuratively by some teenagers or, or well-meaning people in the community who, who band together and uh, see it as a really a mission to – uh, bring back the memories and revive the memories of people who have long since passed. Is it part of the story, though, of, of like, for instance, like in Fort Mill down the road, and, and this just shows you how much I get into cemeteries, um, it was all covered by kudzu. And, and, and mm -hmm. one of my friends says, leave it alone. This is what they're supposed to do. They all live, they all pass, but the kudzu is protecting their story. Interesting. You know, it, if, if enough time passes, one person's uh, sacred burial ground inevitably inevitably becomes another person's important archaeological dig, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me personally, and I understand this idea of going back to nature, but I, I would like to see if it's possible for these places to be kept. And maybe it's the old groundskeeper in me, yeah. uh, but I'd like to see them. I'd like to see the the kudzu kind of cut back. Yeah. Greg, you know this has got to be a special on, on Netflix or Hulu. I mean, come on. You, you, it can't stay within the pages. What are you working on? Right now, uh, I, I'm teaching at the Naval Academy. I teach, I teach English at the, at the U.S. Naval Academy. And besides kind of spreading the word about the book, I've been uh, just concentrating on that. Uh, this was kind of a, a, a unique, although I 
am a journalist by trade. Um, this was a kind of a unique mission for me, and it took me many years to write, and I really haven't looked beyond it yet. Do you see it as a calling? Were you called to do this book? It's a book that I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And I never found the right way to tell the story into the last few years. And so it's a book that's decades in the making. It took me about five years to write. And whether you call it a calling or just, um, you know, something that, that a passion project, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations on this because, I mean, your fan following is going to be unbelievable because people do believe in the story of, the, of these cemeteries and stuff like that. And you've, you've opened a door, sir. Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. Absolutely. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you, dude. Thanks. It was great to talk to you.